Okay, welcome everybody. It is a quarter to 12 and I would like to say welcome to today's webinar called Engaging with the Politics of Water Governance, in which Margreet Zwarteveen will be our main speaker. So my name is Lenneke Knop and I'm from the Water Channel. And um, this webinar is part of the IHE Delft online seminars for alumni and partners, so a very special warm welcome to them. And before starting the webinar, I would like to mention that you can all participate in this webinar by um, sharing your questions in the chat window that you will find in the right bottom corner. And also, I would like to ask if you could type in your name, your organization and your field of expertise so we have an idea of who is in the room. Um, this webinar will take more or less an hour, so we start with Margreet, she will uh, make a presentation. You can share your questions throughout her presentation, but they will be addressed afterwards in the question and answer session. So today we're going to talk about uh, water governance. And um, water governance is often used as an umbrella term. It means different things for different people in different contexts. And also it's quite a new concept. So I learned that before the 1980s, for example, the whole concept wasn't used. You don't find it in scientific articles. But nowadays it's uh, more and more common. There are over 45,000 articles already published. Um, one of the initiatives that also emerged is the chair group at IHC Delft and Margrethe Zwarteveen is a professor of water governance at the institute. Um, today she's going to share her vision and definition on water governance and also the research that they are carrying out in this chair group. So without saying much more, I would like to hand over um, the floor to Margrethe and um, please I would like to encourage you to share your questions in the chat box. Margrethe, the floor is yours. Hello everyone. I'm uh, excited to be here with you and have an opportunity to share the ideas, not just my ideas, but the ideas of the Water Governance Group at IHE about water governance. Actually, we have spent quite some time over the last two years or so to really think through what we think water governance means and how we should define it and conceptualize it. And I'll explain a little bit why. As Lenneke already said, water governance is actually a relatively new term, or at least the use of the word governance in water is relatively new. And this graph shows this, that in, in the early 80s, hardly any article was mentioning the term water governance, and now there are many. And alongside this, this proliferation of the use of the word governance in scientific publications, you can also see a, a wide range of, of initiatives, organizations, institutes that have emerged with the word governance or around water governance. And I think you could say that the IHE group of water governance is one of those because it's the most, it's the youngest group at IHE and I am its professors. I think the Water Governance Group at IHE came into being around eight years ago. I joined in 2014. Um, the, what, how is the word governance used in water? There's, I, I would say there are two broad uses. The first is many people use the word governance to simply say water is also social. And I think this betrays a legacy of thinking about water that has always been engineering focused and natural science focused. So uttering the word governance actually is flagging, hey guys, water is also social. And for instance, the phrase, the, the water crisis is a crisis of governance denotes this use of the term. There is also a second use of the term governance in water, which is often preceded by the word good, the word good governance. Good governance has come to mean and refer to a whole bunch of guidelines, toolboxes, principles, often published or promoted by international institutes like the World Bank, the Global Water Partnership, so these are, you could say, recipes, recipes, recipes about how to do governance. 
And these often focus on process dimensions of governance, transparency, accountability, and integrity. So this is broadly what governance denotes in water. When we at in the water governance group, and we are we are many, we in the water governance group, when we started to think about, hey, but what would do we be our name is water governance, and what do we actually mean when we say the word governance? We started reading, discussing, and we realized that we were unhappy with the way in which the concept was used by many others for a number of reasons, and I'll list them. There are, I think, five. Five reasons for our unhappiness. The first one is that many uses of the word governance foreground concerns of efficiency and productivity. Perhaps this is because of an engineering legacy in thinking about water. What it means is that concerns of equity disappear a little bit into the background. A second critique we had on the prevailing uses of the word governance is that there is often a pro on an emphasis on process, on accountability, transparency, integrity, but there is very little thinking about how good process relates to outcomes. Or there seems to be an assumption that good process will always lead to good outcomes. And we were not so sure of this precisely because it's so difficult to actually regulate water. Water is notoriously capricious. It flows, dissipates, leaks away, evaporates. So the relation between process and outcomes in water is precarious, which is why we think it's important to not just focus governance discussions and studies on process, but to link process studies to outcomes. The third critique we have is that in a lot of writing about water governance, it is presented as if it's a technical matter, as if it's possible to, to come up with universal, generic principles, guidelines, toolboxes, models that, that, that are applicable everywhere, irrespective of context, irrespective of the kind of water that needs to be governed. Actually, we think this is wrong. We think at heart water governance is not a technical matter. At heart water governance is a political matter. It's about choices. It's about choices about where water should flow and to whom. It's about choices about which norms, rules and laws to use for guiding these decisions. It's also about choices about whom should have the authority or the power to make those decisions. So it's political, it's deeply political, and we think when thinking about water governance, this political aspect of, of it should be acknowledged and dealt with. That's why we also, this presentation, we call it engaging with the politics of water governance. And the last point of critique that we have is that many writings on water governance actually write or, or think about governance as it should be. So they are prescriptive. They, they, they write, they present ideal, typical governance situations. You could say dreams. This is how, how what the governance should be. These are nice and these are also useful, but they tell you very little about how what the governance is actually done. So they don't help understanding what actually happens in actual day-to-day -day water governance processes. And this is what we in the water governance group are interested in. We are interested in understanding how it is actually done. So because of all these critiques, we decided to, to come up with our own conceptualization of water governance and our own definitions of it. Of it. In this, we want to, to address some of our own critiques. So rather than having ideal typical formulations of water governance, we wanted to look at 
We wanted a conceptualization of water governance that helps understand how it is actually done. Also, we were keen in foregrounding questions of equity in, discussion, in discussing water governance. So not just looking at productivity, efficiency, effective, effectiveness, but also we wanted a conceptualization that allows making the questions of equity and justice that we think are at the heart of water governance to allow make, making these questions very visible. So to do this, this is the definition of water governance that we are proposing. It's the practices of coordination and decision making between different actors around contested water distributions. There are three words here in this definition that are important. The first one is practices. We use this word practices to, to indicate that we're interested in what people do and not just what they say. So we want to actually focus our studies on documenting and observing how govern, different governance act, actors actually engage with water in everyday actions, everyday practices of decision making. The second important word in our definition is the word contested. This word serves to acknowledge that the political nature of water governance and to acknowledge that in many water governance decisions or many water governance practices, there's always winners and losers. If water flows to, to some people, it means it can no longer go to other people. If some benefit and others lose, which also means that water distributions will always be contested and therefore political. That's why we use the word contested. And of course, the last word and perhaps the most important one is the word, word distributions. This word distributions, as part of a definition of governance, again, we think helps foregrounding that it's always about, it's always political. It's always about some people getting something and others not getting it or getting less of it. It's about, it's about decisions about who deserves to be protected against floods or against the risks of waterborne diseases, for instance, or it's about who deserves to get more water for irrigating crops. It, those are all distributions and those are political. And that they are political, it means also that they are not just based on science, but they're also based on choices. This is our definition. And what I'll do in the rest of this webinar, I'll present some examples, some stories to you of how we can work with this definition and what this definition allows, do, allows doing in terms of understanding water governance. So I want to give some examples of how do water distributions happen through with which technological, institutional and organizational arrangements. How can they be known also? So I'll share some stories. And to make it easier, I have categorized these stories about water distributions in three. The first is stories of the distribution of water and water rights. The second is stories about the distributions of water voice and authority. And the third is the distributions of water knowledge. Let me start with the first, distributions of water and water rights. Actually, in, in my own work, but also in, in many of the contemporary water discussions, there's a lot of talk about, perhaps you have heard about this, virtual water, water footprints. These terms actually refer to the transfer, transfers of water. Often they, transfer, they, they refer to these, the transfers of water from lower value food crops or lower value uses to higher value commercial crops or other high priority uses, industry cities. These are transfers that are actively promoted by national governments, but also by international funders. Why? Because of the concern, international concern, but also national concern with what I would call more euros or more dollars 
per drop of water, concerns of productivity. So the idea is that if water is transferred to higher value uses, this is good. And such transfers are promoted as they are seen as ways to make water governance more productive, more effective and more efficient. It is also a way to, to often it's seen as a way to save water, to either quench the thirst of th cities and industries or to protect ecosystems and future flows. How do such transfers happen? I have a slide here of the gold mine Yanacocha in Cajamarca in Peru, and I'll say a bit more about this later. This is the, the transfer of water from from smallholder farmers in this area to the mining company is one example of a transfer of water that is promoted and let's say um, that is seen as beneficial by many who think about water productivity or water efficiency. Why? Because the use of the water by the mine yields more dollars or more euros per, per drop of water. How do such transfers happen? How are they possible? How is it that a mining company can take water from smallholder farmers? It happens first of all through, this is in Peru, but it happens everywhere, it happens through a uniformization of water rights. So in Peru also uh, there, was a, there was a program to make all water rights the same for the law so that they could be compared and exchanged and transferred. If all water rights are the same and they can be compared, in this comparison it was clear that the users, the water rights, the users of water rights by smallholder farmers were seen as less productive, less efficient. They yielded less money less value for water. This is why the government of Peru was very keen to encourage smallholder farmers to sell their water rights, not to directly to the mining companies, because water cannot be sell, sold, but to the government, so that mining companies could then purchase these rights and use them for their mining operations. So how to, how to read this? How to read this transfer? What are the effects of it? On the face of it, it appears as an almost classical case of accumulation by dispossession and proletarization, with highland subsistence farmers selling their land and water to mining companies to themselves become wage laborers and start working for the mining company. The, in the mining company, working for the mining company, employment is often insecure, wages are low, and lower what they would have earned as campesinos. Yet many of them are happy, be, partly happy at least, because what they earned as smallholder farmers was very little. So for them also the arrival of the mining company in many ways is, is positive. They can increase their wages, they can have better living conditions, also because the mining company invests a lot in in roads, in schools, in hospitals, etc. Yet, the campesino families are also concerned. They're less happy about how the mining company takes away their waters or pollutes it, making it more difficult to irrigate their pastures as they used to be, used to do with the, with the irrigation canals that they themselves had constructed. Yet it's very difficult for them to hold the mining companies accountable for their water actions. Why is this? It's because they are dependent on the mining company for wages, but it's also because they have much less powers and voice in water decision making and in water governance. This is, this is one, one of the few ways that they have to, to articulate what they think. It's by protesting. Protesting and marching against the, the mine. What you see on the slide is one of these protests. And the, the, their banner says, to defend our water, we are ready to go to jail. 
this is a difficult way of voicing concerns. By the government of Peru, it is seen as terrorism. And indeed, if you do it, you risk going to jail. You may be criminalized in this way. What does this show? It shows how water governance in this area is very unequal. It's unequal in terms of to whom the water flows. It's also unequal in terms of who has voice who has the ability to voice concerns about water. This is not to say that the mining company is doing illegal things. Of course, there are all kinds of, of environmental and social impact assessments that the mining company is forced to do to comply with all kinds of regulations. The problem is a little bit that these impact assessments force the mine or, or, or are make the mine account accountable to, uh, you could say, upwards to the government of Peru and to other authorities. Those who experience, directly experience the changes in water, the smallholder farmers, they have very little possibilities to hold the mine accountable. So downward accountability is much more difficult. I am looking at the time to see if I'm going to give another example or not. Um, 12, 12 says perhaps I can. Eh? So let me quickly give one other example of distributions of water rights, which is similar but also very different. This is the slide that you see, is a slide of the plain, Seis plain in Morocco. What you see on one side of the slide, you see a fence, and on the other side of the slide, you see an area that is not fenced. Actually, this fence marks not just a redistribution of land, but also a redistribution of water that is, hap that is happening big scale in this area. In a way, the process is similar to what is happening in Yanacocha in, in Cajamarca in Peru. Here, the government of Morocco also wants to increase its value per drop of water. So it actively invites investors from everywhere to come to the area to buy land cheaply and invest in intensive agriculture. So the government of Morocco wants an intensification of agriculture, the production of high value crops like grapes, for instance, and it subsidizes the all the both the land, but also um, the drip irrigation systems and irrigation systems that new farmers use to make their land profitable. So again, here, a reshuffling of land and water rights, only those with the capital to invest actually have the possibility to, the possibility to acquire this water. What does it mean? It means that some the investors, those with the capital, are considered productive and are cons considered as those entitled to have rights and to have water. Others, the existing smallholder farmers, are considered wasteful, less productive. So some, the changes just appear to favor those who are considered productive, economically efficient, some modern men while forcing those who do not meet, meet these criteria of modernity, including traditional women, to look for other livelihood opportunities. For instance, wage labor on the lands their parents used to own. So this seems harsh, and it seems a bit black and white, and indeed, when zooming in, the picture becomes a little bit different because of the enormous diversity in farming styles and the enormous creativity of many of the farmers in the area. So for instance, you see here you see pictures of young, very young boys actually, young farmers who are very enthusiastic about new opportunities of intensifying farming and new opportunities to use water, new technologies like drip irrigation. So they, in a way, also tap into these new possibilities. I show this to show, to also to illustrate it's not that black and white. What is clear, however, is that these changes in agriculture and this intensification of, agri of, of, 
of farming to more capital intensive modes of production drastically restructure labor and tenure relations and livelihoods at material as well as discursive levels. The, and these changes are marked by existing institutions, institutions that, and also marked by prevailing social hierarchies, and gender is one of them. New modes of farming, about which these, these young farmers are, for instance, very enthusiastic, they are not so open for young women. Young women, instead, have to think of different futures. They dream of finding a rich husband, or they dream of doing in-house businesses like baking or sewing. So it also has gendered implications. Now you may, one, may wonder, we started this conversation as a conversation about water governance. Do you think this is still about water governance? For me, they are. For me, they show that water redistributions are never neatly contained in a water domain. They are intrinsic too, and they help produce much wider changes in Peru, as well as in Morocco, but also in many other countries like India, for instance. In all these countries, rapid processes of agrarian change produce reallocations of land, reallocations of water, changes in, in labor relations that happen that that have deep implications for people living in these areas. The stories also show that these, the decisions about these water redistributions are not just taken by those, form, uh, by those who are formally designated water governance actors. They also happen through land policies, they happen through investment policies and subsidies of the for instance, the ministries of economic affairs and not the Ministry of Water. Um, so it means that water is linked to wider processes of change and water governance is also linked to wider processes of change. And I think that is important. Another one, perhaps other important thing here in looking at these kinds of distributions of water and water rights is that many of many of the reallocations of water do not happen just through laws or to new regulations, but also happen through new technologies. In Morocco, it's drip irrigation systems. In Peru, the mining company is installing reservoirs and new treatment plants, which make it the de facto water manager, manager because it's, it reallocates treated water through a reservoir to smallholder farmers, so the mining company becomes the one deciding where water flows. So it's the, the control of the technology that determines uh, the power to distribute water, and thus water governance powers. These stories of about water redistributions automatically feed into questions about how voice and authority are distributed. And I like to, to think about these questions. When thinking about these questions, I always ask myself the question, where to whom do I go if I think that water distributions are unjust, inequitable, or unsustainable? Who can I go to to complain about my about this and answering these questions we have we have come to realize in the water governance group is not easy it's actually very difficult if you take the the the, the case of Yanacocha of the mining company in Peru actually you'll find that the mining company seems to be more accountable to its shareholders many of whom are not in Peru at all, then it is accountable to the people who directly experience the impacts of its operations, the smallholder farmers. So actually, if, you, if trying to map who makes decisions, how water distributions come about, what you will actually see is not a neat hierarchy with some policy sitting at the top, but what you will see is a a very 
difficult web of entanglements with many different actors who strategize and who all have different degrees of, of influence and certainty, certainty, different perspectives and different interests. They're also on drawing, diff drawing on different resources, on different norms, on different laws. And they have very different repertoires to defend and articulate their positions. Acknowledging, acknowledging this, I think is important because it also prompts modesty in terms of what can be changed or in terms of the extent to which water can be regulated through laws or new norms. And I think this is important because in much water governance writings a sort of a rationalist model of water governance still prevails. I have another example of, of how water governance happens in both Peru and in, in um, Morocco. One way in which the government and water governance actors, water irrigators, in, in the case of Morocco, try to show that they use water wisely is by using drip irrigation. And actually, if you look at... Uh, um, social, no, corporate social responsibility mechanisms for water. It's often also the the drip, the use of drip irriga irrigation that is used as the indicator of wise water use. And I think this shows an, again how difficult it is to regulate water because just having a drip irrigation on one's field says very little about how efficient or how wise water is used. Actually, and I can say more about this, but I think it's important to realize, again, water flows, water leaks away, water evaporates. It's very difficult not just to regulate it, but it's also very difficult to act accurately monitor these flows and to know where it goes. This is already difficult uh, when it is contained in in the network or in pipes, but imagine how difficult it is when uh, when water is underground with groundwater when it's not even visible. This this is one important thing about water governance: the difficulty to see water and to monitor it, control it, regulate regulate it. And this so. These are two other slides to show different ways. Eh? So I, one funny slide about um, a water manager who says, I'm actually a plumber, which I th for me is a, just a small joke to show, hey, yeah, actually a lot of water governance actually, in actual fact, happens through technologies and not through laws or regulations. So it happens, de facto happens through engineering. And another slide to show how water governance processes are often imagined and also organized. It's by inviting users to participate in decision making. And this, of course, comes with, with, its, own, with, with, with its own difficulties. Because who, who is invited and whose voice counts? Um, is it the voice of, in the slide you see, indigena women? Are they when they speak, are they taken as seriously as the engineers who are also in the meeting? These are also questions about voice and authority that water governance, thinking about water governance requires to, to, to... These questions need to be taken very seriously. This brings me to the last, my last point, which is last set of distributions, which is, are the distributions of authority and knowledge in, in water governance. It's, it's linked to what I just said. Who, whose voice is taken most seriously in making water governance decisions? Is it the voice of the hydrologist? The voice of the engineer? Is it the voice of the irrigator? who has irrigated perhaps the same plot for generations already and has contextualized, contextualized knowledge about the area, about the plot and about where water come fr comes from. 
with asking the questions about distributions of authority and knowledge. It's an invitation to deeply think about why some knowledges carry more, carry greater weight and authority than others. How is it that the networks for some types of water expertise and for some water experts acquire wider extension than others? And I have shown a slide here which illustrates this in a, in a different way. It's a slide that was made by the son of a colleague of mine, the son of Pieter van der Zaag, and it shows what the world would look like if, we, if the size of a country would be uh, proportional to the number of research papers published by that country. And I think it's, it's a bit scary because it shows that the large majority of research papers are published by a small number of countries. Also expertise about other countries are produced by those countries. And I think this, this is food for thought. It's also food for thought. My colleague Peter uses this slide to say, hey, an institute like IHE is needed. We need to train more people. We need to train more people from countries in the south, training them to also publish research about their own areas and to become vocal and to develop a scientific voice. I think that is one way to read the slide. The other way to read the slide is, hey, does it matter that wisdom about water is only produced by some, is in majority produced by some people, or that some people and some countries dominate in the production of water wisdom? Here it's also, it's, it's interesting to think, why is it, for instance, that the Netherlands is so keen to mark to use its Dutchness to mark its water knowledge as superior, whereas if we, if we mark, if we talk, say, talk about Ghanaian or Bolivian water knowledge, this always marks that knowledge as local or as, as, uh, so as different. So these are the kinds of questions we as the Water Governance Group would like to address. And this is how we would like to conceptualize water governance. In doing this, actually, we have a method. And the method is to literally follow the water. Literally following the water without, however, treating it treating as if its behavior is mainly the result of hydrology or engineering. We see what the behavior as, of water as coming, as happening, through interactions between ecology and engineered infrastructure and institutions, society. This is, so it's also a deeply interdisciplinary conceptualization. Um, you can wonder, does our approach immediately yield answers, new answers about how to better do governance? or answers about what is good governance. I don't think it does, unfortunately. Yes, we will provide answers in the end. But intrinsically, our answers will be smaller, more pragmatic, and more modest than as compared to the, the toolboxes, principles, guidelines produced by most international think tanks. Think tanks. This is, this is because we are so deeply aware that all water governance is contextual. It's contextual. It's al so always also knowledge about water governance is also always deeply situated. We are also deeply aware su that success for some may mean fa failure for others. Where some win, others may lose. It means that water governance will always entail different difficult compromises. It cannot be done from a single vantage point. Indeed, one single vantage point to decide about water governance we think is dangerous because it always indicates and means a concentration of power. That's why we, we prefer to think of water governance tentatively and as an experiment, taking small steps. Thank you very much, Margreet, for your uh, 
uh, excellent and very clear presentation and um, uh, unusual slides, very uh, explanatory. I would like to start the question and answer session with, um, I've seen several remarks on your presentation, but also we have received some questions uh, in advance of your uh, webinar. And um, yeah, I think with all the questions that we received, you already briefly touched upon it. But I would like to start, um, or would, was there still a slide that you wanted to show? Oh, there's more in, in the joint article that we published. So if you're interested, I would I'd like to encourage you to also read the article or go to our, our blog. Yeah. Thank you. And if, if correct, you should be able, all participants should be able to hover over the links and then you can uh, open the links. It will be opened and also we will put them on the webinar page. So the first question I would like to ask you, we received it from um, Asagu Kibaroglu. He is uh, from the MEF University in Istanbul. Um, he says, water governance incorporates complex processes and various actors with asymmetrical power capabilities. How can equity be operationalized in such complex water governance systems? Um, yeah, you briefly already uh, uh, touched upon this, but maybe you can try to summarize an answer for uh, to this question. Yeah. Uh, so thanks, thank, thanks for the question. The you use the word operationalization, which I think perhaps means that you're not just interested in understanding what what equity means or mapping equities or inequities, but you're also interested in thinking about how you can actually address it in water governance arrangements or processes. Um, I don't have a very straightforward answer, but what I can say is that um, there is a, a lot of interesting work is being done on environmental governance, and uh, I am myself am inspired by the work of Nancy Fraser and David Schlossberg, what they do to think to do and to operationalize uh, equity in, in water governance is they say there are, there are broadly three important things to consider. One is recognition, and with recognition they mean that there is a wide variety of water actors, actors who not just use water differently, in the, and so need different qualities and quantities of water, but who may also conceptualize water differently and who may have different norms and rules to refer to when they think about how water should be distributed. So that is recognition. The second one is distribution or redistribution, which is actually about who gets what when. And the third one is about process, it's about participation, who participates in decision making. And as you will notice, this is very close to the three sets of distributions that I already explained. Yeah. Thank you, Margreet. Another question that we received, um, you started your presentation with that. Um, Abinav asks, would it be right to say that water governance is water management minus water engineering? As in, what is the difference between water governance and the non-technical facets of water management? And um, now, again, I think there is not a, a one-sentence answer to this, but um, yeah, I would like to ask you if you can give some feedback on this. Yeah, yeah. I, I find it a difficult question. Um, also, uh, one way of answering it perhaps is to say that that in the water governance group and also it's also because we are part of IHE which we are so we are surrounded by by a wealth of of natural scientists and engineers who, who with very deep and good knowledge about water that we do not consider water governance as solely social as so so we think water governance actually partly happens through engineering decisions. Mm -hmm. So so I don't do not like to say water governance is water management minus want minus engineering. I think water governance engineers there is there is interesting science and technology scholars 
who have studied engineers and who have called engineers sociologists. They say in their actual work, engineers always also make social decisions. So in studying and doing water governance, I think this is very important. And to not, not reduce yeah. water governance to the social. Yeah. Yeah. This is a partly an answer to your question. Perhaps another, you are also asking for the difference between water governance and water management. That, yeah, you can have many answers to this. I'm not, I'm not, I don't mind so much. I think perhaps the important thing is to realize that any definition often already comes with a particular idea about how water governance or management should happen. So I think the importance here is that if you make, if you make uh, proclamations about water governance or water management, that you should always be explicit in how you define it and also it, about where you come from, what you think is important. Rather than just acknowledging your own political situatedness, rather than hiding behind science or behind some kind of objectivity neutrality. Yes, it's very clear. Okay, then uh, your second case, Pablo Morocco. George de Goya asks, what was the driving force of the problem there? Is it social structure or the intervention? Um, the driving force of the problem in Morocco. Um, I think uh, one way of, of answering this is, is in Morocco, and I think you see this in many countries, I, at least I know it also happens in India, is that there is a, a deep contradiction, in a way, between the aspirations of the country to economically develop and its chosen development model, which is premised on agricultural intensification, and agricultural int intensification requires also an intensification in the use of water, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the, the deep awareness about how water resources are non-renewable non and scarce. So how there is a, a need to treat water more wisely. There's a contradiction between the two. Um, and an easy way to seemingly solve this contradiction is uh, by, by adopting technologies that hold the promise to save water in the future. So if there's water savings in the future, then you don't have to redistribute water or to reallocate it, but you can say, no, we will save water, so everybody... So actually the real problem is that postponed. So in Morocco and in India this happens, for instance, through the adoption of drip irrigation. So the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Water find each other in drip irrigation. That's also mm -hmm. in India. But you can also see it through, for instance, the, the how governments love water treatment plants, desalination plants, etc. All technologies that promise to either create more water or save water. And the, the effectiveness of these technologies is hardly ever tested, but it's clear that they will never create more water or at very high costs. And it's also clear that they will always entail re redistributions of water. But these redistributions sort of uh, often are not highlighted or discussed. They, they disappear through a technification. Hmm. Thank you, Margit. I have a question. Oh, let me make it a bit bigger. It's about funding. So Raúl Pérez asks, can governance be also seen in decision taking for distribution of investments within the water sector and also in the multi-sectoral sphere where water is competition with other sectors fighting for investments? Yeah, thank you, Raúl. That's actually a good question and 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 actually I, I had planned to say something about this you're very right I think especially in in yeah, actually both in irrigation and in drinking water perhaps the largest 
struggles or the larger, larger mm. political fight may not always be about water, but you're very right, may be about public investment. And those are often even more difficult to trace or more more transparent in the building of dams or so yes you're very right I that that is very much part of of water governance yeah. the second question that uh, Raul has I can make it a bit bigger it is very evident from your presentation that economics does influence water distribution decisions in pra practical, I think practical practice. How can we prevent decision inequalities in such contexts that you described? <laughs> that's a that's a multi-million. <laughs> if I had the answer to that, huh? <laughs> I, I don't have the answer. I I only think um, I don't. I really don't have the answer. I only think that it's. Um, it starts with being aware of it, documenting it, and uh, create, yeah, creating, acknowledging it. Um, it also starts with not just defining and conceptualizing water in terms of efficiencies and productivities. So rethinking what perhaps the value of, or the worth of water is and for whom. Um, but yes, uh, um, how can I say this? This is of course also a question about how to change social hierarchies or very unequal power relations, which is a question that is much beyond water governance. But yes, it's part of it. Yeah, yeah some of the participants already mentioned in the chat box that there are no simple answers, and I think that also applies to this one. Maybe one final question to, um, if there's nothing else coming in. Uh, Francis asks, is participation then maybe the underlying word for water governance? Is that the thing to focus on? Um, yeah, the, 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 the word, yeah, the, Perhaps in a way yes, but in another way no, because participation of course has become a bit of a of a buzzword and a, a bit of uh, where the question always is who participates in whose project and who defines the terms of inclusion, and whose voices are heard and, and, and so participation is, is, is important. But by itself, it will never redress existing power hierarchies and existing inequities. I have one more question. That is now really the last question. Mm -hmm. It was about traditional water rights. Let me get this for you. There was a question from Kenya. I'll copy it now into the chat, uh, sorry, into the question box. It's Kathy who says, okay, in Kenya traditional water rights were not well codified by widely understood by local communities. So successive attempts to formalize and implement water rights disregard the traditional rights, disenfranchising local communities from access to what they previously had. Does the current body of water governance research take into account the importance of researching traditional water rights? Is that something that's on the research agenda? Uh, thanks, uh, Cathy, for an excellent question. I think actually this is a question that is very much, it's at the heart of, of, uh, of or if it isn't, it should be at the heart of, of water governance discussions. Because, and, and, and in fact, a lot of the work that uh, I have been involved in 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 the Andean region in in uh, Peru and Ecuador, together with Rutger Bullens, has been about this. About on the one hand, you have the De Soto argument, Hernan De Soto, is, who says all rights should be uniformized, and this is a call that is is widespread. 
the idea that water rights, you cannot have different ways of, of regulating of, uh, uh, water, different water norms of different systems of water rights next to each other because that creates chaos, but more importantly perhaps because this would not allow comparing waters or transferring it. And if you want a water market, which is the implicit ideological agenda of many uh, water governance writings, then such comparability and transfer across different, of different waters is needed. If you are, if you, th if you think like I do, yeah, but actually there is a lot, often a lot of wisdom in traditional water rights and traditional water institutions, then I think you become much, much more cautious in attempts to uniformize. And then really the question becomes how to give credit to these traditional water rights also as a way perhaps of, of empowering such existing communities, communities and recognizing the wisdom that is embedded in traditional ways of engaging with and dealing with water. So yes, it's a very important question. It's very much part of water governance agenda. Thank you very much, Margit. With this, I would like to uh, end the webinar series. I see that uh, the majority of questions, I see there is some sort of need to simplify uh, everything. I can read that from the questions. So I'm very happy that uh, this webinar was here to explain more about governance and also uh, specifically the IAG Delft definition and the approach to that. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Margeet, and thank you, Wim and Maria, in the, also in the back. We cannot see them, but they did a lot uh, to support this. Um, I would like to mention to everybody that there will be a recording um, later today. We will upload it to the watchchannel.tv slash webinars. And also, um, the next webinar in this alumni series will most likely be held in February. So please stay tuned, everybody, and thank you once again for participating in this webinar.